panels this evening uh, to talk about uh, uh, the subject of his book, uh, uh, um, The Other Antisemitism, the, the things that are going on in the Middle East, in, in a wider picture. And I just, this is a church hall, I'm just going to begin with a prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to uh, learn this evening about our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world. Help us, Lord, to learn what has driven the situation at this time. And help us, Lord, to see and to love our brothers and sisters, wherever they're from and whatever colour their skin. Amen. 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 As a GP, I'm that too, but I'm mainly a Christian. My father was a vicar. I came to England in 1975, semi-adopted by another vicar and his wife. And, uh, you know, we've had a life of service for most of my life. And um, I think two years ago I began to feel that my time in medicine is drawing nigh. And, uh, you know, th there are other things that need to be done in this world. And I, I have a heart for the Christians of the Middle East, maybe because I'm one of, of uh, that lot. but. Uh, I think it's a big issue. I think it's uh, a minority that's uh, badly neglected. <coughs> and who better to appeal to them, Christian, uh, you know, fellow Christians. So, um, my book has been available probably for three months. At the end, there's a box here with bad copies, if you like, spelling mistakes. The publisher released them before they were proofread, so you're welcome to them. <coughs> this is a refined copy. And uh, I've not, I'm not doing this to make money, there's not much money in it, but as, as a service to the church. <clears throat> a lot of people ask me why did I choose the title, The Other Antisemitism. So, because people are familiar with Semitism, so I intend to talk about what is antisemitism, who are the Semites, uh, can you be a Christian and an Arab? That's another question that uh, should be asked and answered. A brief history of the church in the Middle East. Uh, how the Jews persecuted the early church in the Middle East, that might shock some people. Um, how Muslims persecuted the church in the Middle East. How Muslims are persecuting the Christians in the Middle East. Uh, a plea from the heart. And uh, I want to share a Semitic dream. So essentially what is anti-Semitism? It is hatred of Jews um, as expressed in aggressive language or actions. Um, it's first, it was first coined in Germany, I think we're familiar with the term, and uh, its worst expression was Holocaust. Um, I think we all know some Jews have survived the Holocaust and I just want to be careful to say that I am Israeli and British, and I'm proud of being both. I'm also proud of being Christian. And I don't think criticizing a country or a church or a group means that you hate them. I hope, you know, I, I, I'm a Christian. Hatred has no place in my heart. Um, People refer to, uh, I have a lot of Christian Jews who uh, say anti-Semitism equals Christianity. Hitler was a Christian. Hitler wasn't a Christian, he was a nominal Catholic. He was actually probably demon possessed. And if, if I'd been alive at the time of Hitler, I would have joined any, any army that fought Hitler to save uh, Jews. Um, um, now, who are the Semites? We, we often, you know, anti-Semitism means hatred of Jews. So does that mean Semites are Jews? Well, it means Semites include Jews, but Jews are the smallest part of the Semitic nation or nations. Uh, the term Semite comes from Shem, one of the sons of um, uh, Lord, uh, Noah. And uh, Shem had several children, but I want to concentrate on this fellow here. He's the father of the Jews and Arabs. And the tree branches here at Eber. Ultimately, you get to Abraham, who's the father of the Jews. But Arabs existed before Abraham. Abraham came out of Chaldea, where they spoke Aramaic, Arabic. Um, and Yoktan is the father of the, what are called the original Arabs. And then out of Abraham came lots of kids, but one of them, Ishmael, who 
whose offspring went to live in Arabia and they are referred to as the Arabized Arabs. The children of Yoktai are the uh, true Arabs and the children of Ishmael are the Arabized Arabs. I say that because Muhammad claims to have descended from Ishmael and Arab equals Muslim. Well, Muhammad wasn't actually a true Arab, he was an Arabized Arab. Um, this is where they dwelt. There was, uh, I mean, I, I hope you're familiar with the map, that's Arabia, what, what is called now Saudi Arabia. Jerusalem is somewhere here. Nazareth is just a bit further north, I think it's the most beautiful city in the world. Of course, I'm biased. But the Christian Arabs lived mainly here, in Yemen, you know, South Arabia, and what is now known as Ethiopia, it was called Aksum. There are also Semites. They are descendants of Shem. Um, there we are. So uh, this is showing the map of the Middle East in 565. The Hassanids, they are my tribe, if you like. Most of the Christians of the Levant, Lebanon, Jordan, and Syria come from the Hassanid tribe. Uh, you have the Latinids who fought alongside the Sassanids. And what the map doesn't show you is the biggest Christian Arab tribe called Tadlib, they all preceded Islam. And what I'm really telling you is Christians, uh, the Arabs were Muslim long, uh, Christian long before Islam came along. So Christianity had taken root in Arabia long before Islam came along. Uh, so can you be a Christian and an Arab? Well, I've already answered it in part. Of course you can. I've just shown you the map. A lot of people equate Christian uh, Arab with Muslim. That's wrong. Arab doesn't equal Muslim. I, as a Christian Arab, I am more Arab than any Muslim. Certainly, I'm more Arab than a Pakistani Muslim. Um, we know that on the day of Pentecost, Arabs were present. Whether they were Jews who spoke Arabic because they lived in Arabia, or Arabs who Judaized, that's another thing I've got to turn your attention to. A lot of Jews went to live in Arabia, and they evangelized. And a lot of the heathen Arabs became Jewish by faith. We know also that Paul escaped to Arabia. And he was there for three years. I don't think an evangelist would have kept quiet. Um, we also know, sorry, um, somewhere um, in, in the fourth century, um, <coughs> most, most, of the, most of Jordan, what was called uh, Greater Syria, had already converted to Christianity by the end of the fourth century. So Jordan, Lebanon, uh, Syria, Palestine was largely Christian and um, in the 8th century there's a story about an Arab uh, prince from um, Hejaz which is this part of Arabia, okay? So the, the holy city of Mecca and Medina are somewhere here, so they're in this region. This prince um, wanted to know more about Christianity he asked a Christian Arab priest to translate the Bible to Arabic. But he said, but you know, don't you dare mention the cross, the crucifixion, Jesus being the Son of God, and some other <laughs> essential Christian doctrine. And the priest said to him, no way. You either take the gospel as it is or not at all. He said, you can kill me if you wish, but I'm not translating it and altering it. It has to come to you as it was given to us. So, of course, you can be a Christian and Arab, uh, Christians were, Arabs were amongst the first recipients of Christianity. There's a logo of the, the Christian Evangelical Church in Arabic. There's an Arab sheikh who converted to Christianity. He and his three sons are pastors. His daughter, of course, helps in the ministry. He comes from Kuwait. We don't hear about these things. And uh, uh, in Africa now, uh, six million Muslims are converted to Christianity every year. Um, in, in the peninsula, uh, about 10,000 a year are coming to Christ. Some of them openly, some not so openly for obvious reasons. Um, uh, Muslim Arabs largely exclude Christian Arabs because obviously uh, we'll go into that in detail in a minute. But uh, Arab history has been written largely by uh, Muslims or, the, or, or financed by Muslims, shall we say, because the educated part of the Arab nation has always been the Christian. Um, and uh, take the famous book, The Life of the uh, Messenger, Muhammad, was written by a Christian called the son of Isaac, Ibn Ishaq. But he was told what to write and he was paid. Um, 
But if you look at archaeology, you see that uh, in the age of ignorance, as Islam calls it, the pre-Islamic period is called the age of ignorance, but that's an Islamic bias. Ignorance, what ignorance? This is when the Arab script was invented by Christians. There's a church in Madabaniya Amman, the capital of Jordan. You see here an Arabic word, Bissalam, in peace. That's a Christian greeting on the grave of a Christian leader. There are um, the church of St. George, Mount Nabal, Madaba, Bissalam. Uh, there are many tombs uh, decorated with Arabic script. There's a Christian. Uh, leader and a poet who died in 328, that's his name, Imru al Qais. There's the Arabic script, there's the original, and it says he was the first Lakhid king to convert to Christianity. So all his people converted to Christianity. Um, you will have heard perhaps about the Kaaba, which is the cubicle building in the middle, middle of Mecca and uh, its significance goes way before Islam, it started long before Islam and the Arabs used to write poetry and hang, drape their best poetry on the walls of the Kaaba. Well a lot of these poets, the best of these were Christian, that's one of them. Uh, and I don't know if you know about the Black Stone which comes from the heathen times, so Islam really perpetuated heathen practice. Uh, so they all kiss and venerate the black stone. And one of the things that Islam holds against Christianity, Christian Arabs, is apparently we venerate Mary. Well, some of us do, not all of us do. We, um, you know, venerate the saints. And I think veneration is one thing and worship is another. But Islam is guilty of the same thing that accuses Christianity. There's a church in Jubail, in Saudi Arabia. You can see the archaeological remains, including a cross. You can't go wrong there. And the church is said to go back to the 4th century AD. Were there Christians before Islam in Arabia? Of course there were. Loads of them. And you can be sure is that the sands of Arabia conceal thousands of Christian churches. And there will be a time when they will have no choice but to dig them out. And they will be filled with Christians who worship Christ, whether they like it or not. Um, the church of hell shall not being the Church of God. There's a church discovered in Yemen, Zafar in Yemen, discovered by a German archaeological team. You can see the cross there, and you know this, this is an image of an Ethiopian king, priest. Uh, this goes back to 524. Uh, in 1990, the remains of a Christian monastery was found in an island uh, near Qatar, so that's Arabia. This is Qatar, and there's an island there. And the amazing thing is, it has loads of Christian symbols, such as the cross. And of course, the authorities didn't want to proceed further because there'll be more discovery. They might even discover the scriptures, for I know, in Arabic. They might discover all sorts of things. And one of the most famous clerics in Arabia said, in Saudi Arabia, how can crosses be displayed when Islam doesn't recognize that Christ was crucified. Do you know that? That's one of the main objections that Islam has against Christianity. The heart of the Christian faith is Christ was crucified for our sins and he rose again. Well, of course they don't believe he rose again because they don't believe he was crucified. And of course they're not going to allow uh, more excavation. But if they were to allow ex excavations, you will find loads of churches. And what impact might this have? It may cause an awakening. <coughs> These fundamentalist Muslims, by the way, some of them are being converted in the middle of ISIS. They go to destroy churches to see the Bible start reading, they get converted. And they have a paranoia about this. That is why I say Islam recruits by force and retains by fear. Islam spread with the sword, no denying that. And anyone who says to you Islam is a religion of peace is either ignorant or just trying to deceive you. Because history speaks for itself. Islam itself brags that's spread by the, by the sword. Um, there's a saying in Arabic that, you know, conquest by the sword and victory by the Quran. So it's not a secret, but they're afraid of uh, people discovering their roots. Um, I want to move on to the persecution of the, the 
the Christians in the Middle East. In my book, I refer to both historical fact and personal experience. Um, I lived in Israel, Jewish state. My parents were Arabs, Christian Arabs, and I grew up listening to Jewish boys and girls calling me dirty Arab. Not, not a very nice thing. My wife thinks I'm too arrogant to be touched by it. Maybe she's right, but it's not nice. Um, I remember there was a strike in Israel um, in the 70s, uh, in the south of Israel, in a port, and the police were pushing the strikers around. And one guy stood up and he said, don't treat us as if we were Arabs. And that gives you something about the psyche of some Israeli Jews. Um, go to their religion, the Talmud. Some of you will know Talmud is like tradition for our Catholic brothers and sisters, uh, like the Hadith for Islam. So you've got the holy book and you've got the tradition. Now to a lot of Jews, the Talmud is even more important than the Old Testament. And in the Talmud, they teach Jews are called human beings, but the non-Jews are not humans. They are beasts. That's in the Talmud. It also says the akum, the non-Jew, and literally it means the sterile, because we're, you know, if, you're not, if you're not a Jew, you're doomed. You know, you're sterile, you're not going to propagate. It is like a dog. Yes, the scripture teaches to honor the dog more than non-Jews. Now, you know, we all think of Jews as victims of the Holocaust, and there have been victims, but there isn't, there isn't a race on earth who's not capable of, uh, you know, uh, arrogance and, and supremacy. And, and um, in Israel, the Jews often behave as the oppressor. And we need to come to terms with this fact. I've just had a, a nice review to my book from a, a fairly famous a Christian lady. And the only objection she had to the book was that I had a go at the Jewish uh, state of Israel, the only democracy in the Middle East. Yes, the only democracy, but only a relative democracy. Israel is not really a democracy. It's based on Jewish uh, pure blood. They, they want a Jewish state. They can't be democratic. They exclude Arabs from all sorts of things. I mean, have you heard recently about the, what they're doing to the uh, Christian schools? The Christian schools of Israel are older than the state of Israel. Some of them are two or three hundred years old. They fund 100% Jewish religious schools. <coughs> they refuse to give more than 60% funding to the church schools. And they refuse to allow parents to contribute more than a certain amount. They have all sorts of excuses. But they are determined to de-Christianize Israel. And uh, that's the thinking behind it. Let's not be naive. Um, ben Gurion, I don't know if you've heard of Ben Gurion, one of the founders of the State of Israel. I meant to bring my Israeli ID with me. He refused to carry an Israeli ID because he objected to the Arabic script inside it. How racist can you be? I remember driving through France, you know, borders between France and, German, uh, and, and uh, Spain, and it says France in French and in Arabic because they have five million Arabs there. Now. You know, Palestine was almost 100% Arab until about 60 years ago. Um, now, I don't know if you watch the news, the Tarbot Church, church by the late Tiberius, recently set on fire by a Jewish extremist. The response from one of the most, uh, one of the leading lights of, uh, oh, lost my place. Uh, the response from one of the leading lights in Israel has been that, yes, let's burn more churches. How do you like that? You don't hear about it. The British press isn't going to tell you about it because there, there is a bias. Um, this is a, chai, a, a, a Jewish chap. I don't know whether he's actually celebrating or whether he's relieved. He set on fire the house a, a Palestinian house, it happened to have been a Muslim house, but it's a human being. He killed the baby, and a few days later, the father also died. What is his punishment? Six months in prison. Now, that is anti Semitism, isn't it? It's Jewish anti Arab anti Semitism. Nobody speaks about that. Now, I want to move on to Christian anti Arab anti Semitism. Christians in the West. Not deliberately, but subconsciously, because we associate Arab with Muslim, with backwards. Um, you know, I want to remind you that 
we Christian Arabs, including the Assyrians, we translated most of the Greek words into Assyrian and then Arabic. We took them to Spain, and the Hassanid part of the Arab army took them to Spain, translated to Spanish and Latin, etc. And that's how you got a lot of your learning, thanks to your Christian brethren from the Middle East. There's an old colonial missionary attitude that perhaps doesn't appear so often nowadays, but when I was growing up, it was very strong. Um, my mother used to work in a mission hospital in Nazareth. There was the Zemanas, and it wasn't very nice. But thank God it's changing. There's an obvious preference for Jewish, uh, you know, the Jews over the Arabs within the church. Not everybody's like this, but my daughter was sharing this book with her best friend in an evangelical church, and her friend said, for goodness sake, keep quiet, my mother can hear you. So her mother could hear that we were criticizing the state of Israel. Big deal. Um, and I think in some places there's a near complete neglect of the church in the Middle East. There is that sense of brotherhood or sisterhood. I think that needs to change. I talked a little about Jewish anti-Christian Arab and Semitism. I told you about the church in Tava. But I want to go back in history. This is Yemen. And one day it was called the Kingdom of Himya. And it was led by uh, either a Jew or an Arab who had converted to Judaism. Uh, and as king, he ordered the burning of churches, the killing of Christians, and he's known to have killed 20,000 Christians in one night. He was foolish enough to write to the king of Persia and to, uh, to the you know, Byzantium saying, do the same, Byzantium is Christian. So they sent the armies to Ethiopia and they crossed over and unfortunately they destroyed him. I say unfortunately because it's not Christian, but that's the world we live in. Uh, in my book, I refer to Muslim anti-Christian Arab anti-Semitism. There are Muslim Arabs who persecute Arabs just because they are Christian. And that, um, um, you hear about ISIS, have you ever wondered? Why ISIS are doing what they're doing to Christian uh, Assyrians and Arabs in Iraq and Syria? Is it a new? It isn't a new thing. They're just copying um, what happened before. You may have heard about the conditions of Omar, when the Muslim armies under the second Khalifa of Omar uh, conquered Jerusalem uh, with the help of Jews, of course. Um, the uh, the main uh, bishop in Jerusalem refused to hand over to the armies. He demanded to speak to Omar, the, the, the caliph who succeeded Muhammad. And apparently, the Christians voluntarily agreed to these conditions. So the conditions read uh, something like, I, I willingly agree to you know, build no monasteries, build no churches, fix no churches. You can read for yourself, but it includes ridiculous things like, you can't wear the same clothes as a Muslim because you're beneath them. You can't be buried near a Muslim, you know, in case you defile them. Uh, if you see a Muslim, you know, coming from the opposite direction, you have to move aside out of respect. Uh, you can't ride a horse like a Muslim does, because you're not worth it. Of course, um, you can't sell liquor, it's no big deal, I, I don't think none of us would complain. Uh, you can't ring your bells on Sundays, you can't be heard praying, you know, church singing can't be heard in public. Um, we talk about crosses, and of course what is ISIS doing now? Ripping crosses from <coughs> churches. In fact, in, um, in Italy, I don't know if you read about this, only a couple of months ago, <coughs> a poor man whose daughter or son are dying uh, approached the statue of Mary. I'm a Protestant, I don't, I don't do this sort of thing, I don't believe in it. But you have to allow people to do what they believe. I have no right to tell someone you mustn't do this, let alone do what these people did. So he was assaulted by five Muslim immigrants who ripped the prayer, tore it, pulled the statue of Mary down, smashed it, and then pulled the willies out and weed on it. Now, and that is in, Christian, in a Christian country like Italy. Sadly, the Pope was too conciliatory, you should at least say, that's not acceptable. But, um, well, we've covered these. Now, to date, you find that these are being applied by ISIS. 
Now, what is ISIS's inspiration? Are they extremists? What is an extremist? I think if you're a true Muslim, you are an extremist because Islam is extreme. I've just quoted two verses from the Quran, just to illustrate my point. Think, tell me what you think of this. You recognize the picture? The 21 uh, Egyptian, Coptic Egyptian martyrs in Libya, slaughtered simply for being a Christian. And I, don't, I can't tell you how proud I am of these people because the courage they displayed. They were given a choice between living as a Muslim or dying as a Christian, and they chose to die in Christ. I think they're, they're just incredible. And uh, you think, what are we doing in the West? We don't even challenge a desecration like the one in Italy. Have we become cowards? What's wrong with us? But it's like the Quran says, fight those who do not believe in Allah. Allah is the God of Islam. Or in the last day, and who do not consider unlawful what Allah and his messenger. His messenger is equal to Allah. So it's not good enough to believe in Allah, you have to believe in his messenger, Muhammad. Basically, if you're not a Muslim, you have to be fought and killed. Um, and who have made unlawful and who do not adopt the religion of truth, which is Islam, from those who were given the scripture. So he's talking about those who were given the scripture, which are the Christians and the Jews. So those, if they don't agree with Muhammad, you've got to kill them. Okay? Or you have to impose jizya, which is a tax, protection money, so they are humiliated. So the evil of the jizya isn't just a financial value. It's actually, there's a ceremony. You have to crawl on all four, come before the regional ruler, and you have to offer your money, bowing down, and then you get smacked on the back of your head as a sign of uh, submission. Uh, now, Muhammad practiced this. Muhammad destroyed all tribes. The Muslims claim that Muhammad was given to the world as mercy. I don't know what mercy means when he killed people, poked their eyes and they exploded, he raped, he decimated the whole Jewish tribe. I don't know how many wars he has to his name. 10, 15, he has 16 women to his name. Uh, I don't know how that's mercy. And he himself said, Muhammad said, my wealth is rests in the shadow of my spear. So he obtained his wealth by fighting. He also, uh, there's another verse, and when the sacred month, that is Ramana, died, passed, then killed the polytheists. Anyone, we are polytheists. Christians believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They don't accept that we believe in one God. They, they accuse us of believing in three. Don't tell me Islam is a religion of peace. Even today, um, a Christian can't testify in court against a Muslim. If you've got an Egyptian Muslim in court, a Christian neighbor can't testify against him because we are inferior. Uh, they're not, we're not allowed to build churches. Now, the Navy, an, an exception nowadays, El Sisi, the current president, has announced that he wants to build a memorial church to commemorate the 21 martyrs. Watch that space. Um, Christian women are captured, raped, uh, you know, Christian children are captured, and sometimes even the ransom has been paid, it's still killed them. And that's taken place ever since the beginning of Islam. Egypt was a solid Christian country, and of course it was targeted. Um, there's been a story about a Christian village in Egypt recently, where the Muslims were, um, you know, demanding that Christians leave. And the authorities said, you have to leave. Now, why? Why can't they stand up to them? That's Christian, that's, a, a, you know, anti-Semitism of, of a kind. One million Palestinians support ISIS. That actually frightens me. Where I come from, Israel, Palestine, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, there's about three million Christians. That's one third who admit to supporting ISIS. That's, that's not a minority. So our politicians refer to an extremist minority. It ain't an extremist minority. It is a, ma a majority. David Cameron had the guts to talk about quiet condoning because it's more than just one third. On a recent program, Al Jazeera, I don't know if some, some of you watch Al Jazeera, an Arab news program, they're very clever. 60% of people who watched that program supported ISIS. That's not a minority. <coughs> I'm bringing you up today. I don't know if you've heard of this lady. Uh, Maryam Ibrahim, mm -hmm. yeah? 
roughly a year ago in Sudan. She was uh, uh, put under arrest and was taken to court, an Islamic court, and <coughs> judged that she is an apostate. Now, her father is Muslim, her mother is a Christian. She was brought up by her mother. She chose to be a Christian. You can't apostatize from Islam if you've never been a Muslim. But they don't, they, they don't consider that we exist. Her mother doesn't matter. That life of her mother doesn't exist. And I'm referring now to a theology of superiority. And that they share in common with the Jews. They have a theology of superiority. We don't have that in Christianity. In Christianity, all are the same. We're all sinners. You know, we're, we're all uh, redeemed sinners. And uh, certainly Jesus had no kingdom on earth. He didn't come to build a kingdom. Both the Jews and Muslims want a kingdom on earth. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. This lady was condemned to death. And thanks to the intervention of the Italians, the Americans, David Cameron and a few, she has been released. But the treatment whilst in prison was just incredibly inhumane. Um, this is a very touching story. I recommend you go onto uh, YouTube and look up Canon Andrew White. I'm sure that our vicar knows what I'm talking about. An amazing, incredible, brave man. Um, he tells with tears the story of excuse me, four little Arab boys or children. ISIS, and they were told you must, you must say the Shahada, which is you know I, uh, you, you know I, I confess that uh, there's only one God and that Muhammad is his messenger. And he says no, we can't. And I said why? Don't you want to live? And I said we love Jesus. We love Jesus. And that's, those were the last words, and they were just beheaded. <coughs> Religion and peace.
with animal urine and dung. The stench is just indescribable. Imagine those organic materials mixed with heat. It's just incredible. And that's really an insult. So Muslims mock the Holy the Church. But in Arabic it's called the Church of al Qiyama, which means the resurrection. And they call it the Church of al Qiyama, which means rubbish. Can you imagine mocking the churches and mosques? They have a theology of superiority. Um, I'm now dealing with why do Muslims reject Christian Arabs? Why do they despise us so much? Uh, we've actually done a lot for the Arab nation. We taught them how to read, how to write. We wrote their poetry. In fact, a lot of people believe the Quran, the, the description of heaven, is based on Christian Arab poetry, almost word for word. Um, we move on to the Arab nationalism of the 19th century. Who led Arab nationalism? It was Christian Arabs. Christian Arabs who owned newspapers, um, and of course, gradually, they were displaced, squeezed out by Muslim Arabs, to the point that nationalism has been Islamized. People talk about Palestinians as if they're Muslims. I used to do medicals for uh, victims of torture. Uh, a lot of them were Muslims from the Middle East. And as soon as I said I'm a Palestinian, they assumed I was a Muslim, and the poison that would come out of their mouths, only to their embarrassment when I told them I'm actually a Christian, my father was a pastor. Um, and uh, of course time is too short for me to go on about there's a long section in the book about uh, the, the affairs of the Christians under various Muslim rules it's the Umayyad period and the Abbas period and so on and they're really all as bad as each other uh, and I've summarised the whole period with this long sentence but I hope you'll find it helpful uh, for Arabic speaking Christians to survive in the shadow of a Muslim majority in the Middle East has been akin to living in the vicinity of a volcano, which erupts every now and then. These eruptions may last for, few, uh, for a long time, during which Christians have had to lie low and simply survive, in the hope of better times to come. When the volcano has lain dormant, uh, Christians have flourished and felt free to express themselves fully, both as Arabs and Christians. But the volcano erupts fairly often. And now we're seeing one eruption. Um, I'm sorry about the graphics. Um, in my book, I lay a challenge to Jews, to Arabs, to Western Christians, but to the Muslim Arabs particularly. I say, you know, what is source for the goods should be source for the gander. I, as a Christian Arab, as a Christian, I'm not allowed to walk into Mecca. I'm too dirty, too impure. Uh, I would defile it. But they live in Jerusalem, they live in Bethlehem, in fact they've targeted Bethlehem in 1948 was 80% Christians, now it's hardly 10% Christian. They've been squeezed out by commercial pressure, direct threats, assaults on women, uh, school kids are forced to, uh, uh, you know, say the shihada, you know, uh, I confess that uh, Muhammad is the messenger of God, and um, so I don't want Muslims excluded from Nazareth and Jerusalem and Bethlehem, but I'm saying treat us equally. If you are honest and sincere about Arab nationalism, just as you forbid us from entering Mecca, you exclude yourselves from Nazareth and Bethlehem. And I know this will be abused and misquoted, but it's not a time to be silent. I end with a plea from the heart. And I plead with everyone, and I say, let not the birthplace of Christ, not just Bethlehem, but the Holy Land, be the burial ground for Palestinian Christianity, indeed Arab Christianity. We need help from the West, we need people to be more outspoken. Yeah, I need you guys to write to your MPs, write to the Prime Minister, write, write to, I've written to uh, Baroness um, Darcy, you know, she resigned because uh, David Cameron didn't take the right stance over Gaza. Well, what happened in Gaza? Gaza is Palestinian. It's not just Muslim. We have churches there. We have host Christian hospitals there. And why didn't she resign when David Cameron and the government didn't speak out against the persecution of Christians? Why didn't she speak out against the persecution of Christians? Like because she's a coward.
I say to Christians, wake up, read us cover, and own your faith. 60% of this country have called themselves Christians. The vicar will tell us maybe 5-10% come to church. We need an awakening. And we need to be outspoken, speak out. To the Jews, I say, your father Abraham, I showed you the family tree of the Jews and Arabs, is our father too, the father of the Arabs and the Assyrians. Abraham is our cousin, unfather to many Arabized Arabs. Neither Abraham nor Abraham would be too pleased with the discrimination you have uh, exercised against your Arab or even Assyrian brethren. To the Muslims, I say, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. You're familiar with the story of Cain and Abel? Cain killed Abel and the Lord appeared to him and said, the voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. And I say to the Muslims, the voice of your Christian Arab brethren cries from the blood that you have shed. And one hopes that they would uh, listen. Finally, and this is truly finally a Semitic dream, and I'll just let you read my dream. And I think the only way we're going to have peace if both Muslims and Jews give up their idea of superiority and adopt uh, an attitude of brotherhood, harmony, we should be equals, people should be allowed to choose their religion, we should be allowed to change their religion, and the people should not live in fear. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I hope it's not been too long or boring. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Christianity look at 
Christianness, what Christians did in the past. We're all capable of evil, but I would rather compare Christianity with Islam. Christianity does not teach violence, Islam does. I quoted just two verses from the Quran, there are hundreds. You are instructed to go and fight them. And when Peter came to defend Jesus with a sword and he cut the ear of uh, uh, one of the uh, soldiers, what did Jesus say to him? Peter, put your sword in its uh, uh, sleeve. He who is taken, who, he who takes by the sword is taken by it. And Jesus came to make peace. Muhammad did it. So all religions are not the same. Yes. I, I figure we have to not pretend to know anything about Islam. Sure. Um, I, I, I think I can see some of what you said. I think I've got a fundamental misunderstanding in my head. I hear on the TV frequently um, members of the Muslim community to turn and say on the TV such things as my faith does not teach me to be violent and take up the sword. Yeah. I have heard you say the exact opposite. Mm. So can you comment? Yes, yes, of course. I, I hear this all the time. But I, I think, what is a Christian? Who is a Christian? Um, who determines what Christianity is? Christianity is recorded in, in the Bible. If you like, the 39 articles summarize it for us Anglicans. Uh, and so on. The Nicene Creed summarizes it in a nice way. But individuals do not determine a religion. Christianity has been with us for 2,000 years. No one today can reinvent it. There are a lot of nice Muslims. Uh, I'm, I'm a GP as a, a trainer. I've had lots of wonderful uh, Muslim trainees. And they, have, they can't identify with ISIS. But guess what? They don't know their religion. Now, it doesn't matter what people say, it's what the religion says. Now, to some people, Christianity is a cultural thing. You know, I'm a Christian, but I, I don't believe that Jesus was God. Am I a Christian then? Uh, there are lots of Muslims who don't know the Quran. They, they haven't even heard of Al-Hadith, the tradition. But I've only quoted you two verses from the Quran. If you go, <coughs> go on, on the internet and type Islam and violence and see what Muslims tell you the Quran teaches. The Quran speaks for itself. The life of Muhammad speaks for itself. Was he violent? He wants to know something about it. He fought, he killed, he raped, he robbed. Nobody can say, yes, there are nice people who don't believe in violence, the violence, but just because they call themselves Muslims doesn't mean that Islam does not preach violence. I think you need to distinguish between the two. Do you believe a uh, hundred years ago the Middle East and so divided up by the European powers yes. without any thought yes. to which tribe, etc. Yes. belong to whom, mm. to just draw a line and say yes. you live there and you live there. Do you think that is part of the problem, the trouble in the Middle East? It, it is, but I'm loath to blaming the ills of the Middle East on the West because it's kind of puerile. Uh, there are people who say ISIS was invented by the Americans. Okay, let's assume the Americans wanted to create ISIS. Do these Muslim Arabs have no brains? Are they automatons? Can the Americans really control the way they think? No. The, they have a religion and they're following it. That's why they are what they are. Yes. I mean, I refer to the um, uh, Balfour Declaration, which, um, which is why we have a Jewish state now. <coughs> it, it said that Jews can have a home in Palestine, provided they do not compromise <coughs> the religious and cultural rights of the indigenous population. I've just mentioned what they're doing to our Christian schools. Mm -hmm. I'm not allowed to um, share my faith with a Jew. They have anti-missionary laws. Democracy? What democracy? I would love to show you an exchange I've had on Facebook with a few, a few Jews uh, calling Jesus a bastard. He said, your Yeshua is a manzeb, bastard. Now, what is that? Is that not, uh, you know, bigotry? What is that? Uh, yes, of course, the um, colonial powers have 
to show some blame, but I, I, I wouldn't say it's all their fault. But when you say that, mm. um, I, I mean, we go back to 1947, 48. Yes. And we're talking about the Balfour um, de Declaration. Um, and you say that um, they were given this Jewish state, provided they allowed the Arabs to continue with their culture and their way of life. Yes. But they've done, since that, that was done, yes. under Ben Gurion and, and, and um, uh, I think um, the, um, that there was a, an organization called... Um, the Lagoon. The Lagoon. Yeah. Uh, um, that they've, they've practiced since then, and they're still doing it today. Yeah. The exact opposite of what that, yeah. uh, the conditions of that, creating that state mm -hmm. laid down was how it was to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, and to this day, they are still doing, they've restricted the Palestinians to a Gaza Strip, a strip yes. of land, mm -hmm. uh, and they build, they expand. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I was out in Cyprus in 1967, was it? The, the Six Day War. And then when they defeated all the Arab nations that got together. And I, I was a soldier then, and I thought, that was pretty, pretty impressive, you know. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, if you look at it, you find, no, they did, the Israelis did that with the help of the Americans and the British and so on and so on. And ever since then, they've just, Expanded and expanded yeah. and expanded. So one, once one does have this understanding that Muslims um, are violent and they, one can see probably that there is a reason underneath it all. Why? Uh, I think you, I think if you look at history, you can't blame Muslim violence on the state of Israel. It's terrible behavior, because that's only really recent. Islam started in the seventh century, and they've been doing what they've been doing, what ISIS has been doing for 1500 years. Yeah. But I, I think that, I mean, there's a chapter in my book, you know, um, about the conflict and the wars, and uh, I call it the dialogue of the deaf. I don't want to start a portion of the day, you know, we Arabs are better than Jews, and the, or the Jews are worse than us. You know, it's human nature, human nature is greedy. You know, that, that, and, and, it, and, and I think when, when man is far away from God, he, you know, we, we will behave greedy. And yes, the state of Israel was based on deception. I mean, my, two of my uncles were in Lebanon on holiday when the state of Israel was declared. Borders were shut, they, they weren't allowed to go back. My uncle's house was next, next door to ours. The state of Israel took it. And they used a really quite ironic term, cynical I should say, uh, they call themselves the watchmen, Al Harris. They're watching over my uncle's house. Well, just to keep it in the family, my eldest brother had to buy it from the state. Um, I don't know how many million, maybe a million Palestinians were displaced by force. They were actually thrown out of their homes. Some were shot in cold blood, and some escaped, and they were not allowed to return. Why? They are still asking to be allowed to return. There are Christian villages. I show pictures in my book of Christian villages that were completely evacuated for no reason, no reason given. And they were told, oh, in a week we'll go back. It's been, what, 60 years? And guess what? Talk about this oppression. Some of these churches have become cow pens. That's an insult, isn't it? If you took a synagogue and you, you brought cows into it, there's one church where my niece had her wedding a few years ago. That's still accessible to us, but there are lots of Christian villages that are completely evacuated for no good reason, and now you have Jewish settlements in that place. That's theft. Mm. Oh yes, they compensated some, but they decide the price, they decide that it has to be sold. That's not a democracy. I have to say, Israel is a relative democracy. It's certainly more democratic than Saudi Arabia, but come on, who isn't? And Israel has a free press, that's good. Um, and, and I think, you know, it, it's a troubled region, and no one party is better than another. I think we, we've got, you know, it's all relative. Yeah. Yes. It's getting back to what I was saying earlier, 100 years ago, after the war, we said, right, we'll have a state of Israel. Yeah. So they keep the Palestinians there. Yes. I'll, I have a friend who was yes. in there at the time. Yeah. And uh, they keep the Palestinians there. I said, right, there's your state yes. of Israel. Well, 
which is it's trouble about having the airport. Which oh yes, is, which as is I said, you can the problem. It, it's yeah. retaliation. You know, if if you commit evil, it's consequence. That's not the punishment. The consequence for evil is more evil. <coughs> if you hurt a man, he will hurt you. Uh, unless obviously you're a Christian and believe in forgiveness. I forget who was sharing with me this evening that the African Caribbean teacher was stabbed. What a, a breath of fresh air. And the nine um, African Caribbeans killed in their church in the States. The first thing the church did, church members, relatives, was to forgive. And that's why we need Christianity in the Middle East. Uh, I don't know if some of you have watched a little Assyrian girl called Miriam. Again, go on YouTube, type Miriam, Assyrian girl. Beautiful girl, she's probably nine, most. And they're interviewing her, they're saying, you know, ISIS took your home. They killed your relatives. They threw you out of your hometown, out of your country. Do you hate them? No, she said. She said, I'm a Christian, I don't know how to hate. That's what we need in the East. So the loss of Christianity in the Middle East is going to be a damnation on the Middle East because it's the only religion that preaches peace, love, forgiveness. The other two don't. And the other.